uh, with our, our first verse. Verse 21. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. Here we see that by nature, we rebel against God and remove from his presence. There's three descriptions of who we once were. There's three de descriptions of who we are without Christ. We're alienated, we're hostile in mind, and we're evil in every deed. Let's first look at how we are removed from his presence. Alienated, held off at a distance. Our sin, apart from God's grace to draw us close to him, causes us to be at a distance from God. The reason is, he is holy. And being a holy and glorious God, he cannot be in the presence of our sin without consuming us. This is, again, why Moses could not see all of God's glory. He was a sinner, not yet perfectly claimed and purchased by the death of Christ. We are sinners. We see this alienation best take place in the Garden of Eden. God created us to know him, to love him and to be loved by him, to know his personal intimate presence. That's what Adam and Eve got to enjoy in the garden. And it wasn't God who chose to send us out. It is us. It was Adam and us in Adam that chose that we know what's best. We chose to forsake his law. We decided we knew better than God. We decided that we did not want his loving, righteous rule. We wanted to rule ourselves. And the necessary consequence of us rejecting God, of us denying God and rebelling against God, is that he cast us out. We were thrown out of the garden, and then we were protected from ever going back in. And we, as sinners, have all been alienated ever since. That is, until Christ came to seek us. You see, our, the consequences of sin is that we, we we're held at a distance from God. His wrath and his, his, his holiness, his anger is against us as sinners. We continue to cling to our sin even today. We decide, we decide that we will choose our sin rather than to obey God. Christian, do you ever feel like God is still distant? Do you ever still sense a feeling of alienation? Do you ever pray and it feels like the prayers only hit the ceiling? When you're trying to seek God, you, you don't hear him, you don't experience him. You feel like you're just talking and no one's listening. We go through seasons where we experience alienation, a, a sense of alienation. If we're truly believers, we must remind ourselves that God, if he has reconciled us to himself, we are his children and no longer alienated. Our experience deceives us. If we ever, as Christians, feel as if God is distant, we need to do two things. First, we need to remind ourselves of God's love. Our feelings, our experiences, they can deceive us. While we may be praying and seeking and, and never feel like we're getting that connection God has promised us, that doesn't mean that connection isn't there. That means there's something wrong that we need to pursue further. But if God has said he loves us, he loves us. If God has reconciled us, we are reconciled. We need to fight our deceptive experience with God's word that makes us aware and sure that God has called us. We need to go deeper in prayer and fasting and scripture meditation to make sure we are reminding ourselves of who God is and that he keeps his word. Secondly, we need to think about this feeling of distance in light of the gospel. That means we need to start pursuing, is there a sin in my life that is causing this feeling of distance? The first thing you need to do is ask, what sin was revealed to me that I did not repent of that I can trace back this feeling of distance? When did I start feeling this alienation? When was the last time I experienced the intimate presence of God? Trace back and look, what is that gross sin that God revealed 
that you refused to give up? Or what is that self-righteousness, that counting yourself worthy and holy, when did you stop pursuing Christ? That's when you started feeling alienated. But God's presence has always been in you with the Holy Spirit. Let's continue to think about our sinful condition with the next two phrases. We're hostile in mind and evil in every action. We were rebellious in thought and deed. Hear what what Paul also says in Romans 8. As a sinner, our mind is set on the flesh. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. See, our hearts apart from Christ, our hearts apart from the Holy Spirit coming in and regenerating and illuminating and converting, our hearts are opposed to God. It's fighting God. Our our hearts have the posture of fighting. Our minds are opposed. They're hostile. They're wanting to fight against. We cannot submit to God unless he actually does a good work in us first. It is our internal sin, the thoughts, attitudes, and desires, and imaginations that are opposed to God. It's not what we take in that makes us evil. It's actually what is produced in our hearts that comes out that makes God's wrath fall upon us. Here are the words of Jesus in Matthew 15. Do you not see that whatever goes into your mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. See, it's what we produce in our minds. It's the ideas and the desires that come out of our sin nature. That's what makes us hostile against God. That's what causes God's wrath to be against us. Now, Christian, if we're all honest with ourselves, or non-Christian, what kind of thoughts do you have throughout the day? Where does your mind wonder? How embarrassed would you be if someone actually got to peer in to the kinds of things that go through your heart and through your mind? You see, our hearts, those internal sins, what we produce, they're much more evil than our actions. We know how to clean up what we say and what we do. It's what's inside of us that's disgusting. The more honest we are, the more we see what is inside of us is truly gross. We don't want anybody peering in there, but God peers in there. And he says, I love you. He says, I'll heal you. He says, I'll forgive you. We should be embarrassed of the things that come in our minds and through our hearts. We need to be on guard against those things. This is why we need to be transformed in our minds. We need to protect against those imaginations, those those ideas that we entertain thinking they're they're not that dangerous. I can control it. It'll never come out. We need to be transformed in our minds by thinking about the gospel, thinking about who Christ is and what he's done for us. We need to set our minds on the things above, as Paul will tell us later in Colossians. Being outwardly changed is not enough. God wants to begin the work here so that whenever we are actually living out the Christian life. It's not self-righteous. It's the fruit of what God is doing. Hear this charge from Paul in Philippians 4.8. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You see, it's, it is the things that we're going to put in our minds that will affect us. Our hearts are already sinful enough to produce sin. When we start feeding ourselves more garbage, it's only going to produce more garbage. We need to be careful of what we think about, what we meditate upon. Children especially. Protect your minds now. Do not let your minds and your meditations Be upon sinful things. Be upon lustful things. Be upon anger. Protect your minds because your innocence cannot be regained 
Once you lose it, your mind is forever corrupted by that. Christ can save you. He loves you anyway. But there's consequences of every thought that we capture. Begin by meditating upon God and His good gifts. Get a promise, a Bible promise book and just meditate upon all the promises that God has given you and let that be your delight. The second part of this evil is not only hostile in mind, but evil in action, evil in deed. The relationship of our mind to our action is very important. And Paul lays this out in Romans 1 very clearly and very explicitly. Paul says, God gave us up to our lustful passions, and the result was that we dishonored our bodies. He says that God gave us over to our debased minds, and the result was all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, envy, strife, murder, deceit. Now, Romans 1 is describing that alienated person, the person who is opposed to God and fighting against God. That sin is still present within us. Yes, we've been saved from it. Yes, God has declared us innocent, but that sin still lingers. Do not trick yourself into thinking that you can control those little guilty pleasures of imagining sin. Fight. Before, fight what happens in your mind and your heart so that it does not come out in your actions. Our evil, our sin, is just looking for an opportunity to burst forth at whatever opportunity. I've been humbled within the last few hours of this. I was frustrated. I wrote an email. I did not plan on sending that email. I voiced my frustration in that email, and it got sent somehow. I didn't send. Maybe God did. Maybe Lillian did. I don't know. But it has hurt my relationship with a dear friend and a dear brother. You see, my sin that I let fester took opportunity. When that sin takes opportunity, it hurts. It hurts us. It hurts others. Be careful of the kind of sins we harbor. Why is it important to remember who we were? First, the greater we understand the depths of our own sin, the greater we're going to cling to Christ. The greater we see how evil our thoughts are and our heart is, the greater we're going to depend upon Him and thank Him. Secondly, we must remember what's inside of us so that we never stop fighting it. We never arrive until Christ calls us home. We never arrive. We must continue the fight. We still suffer under the causes of our sinful heart, even if we are forgiven of the guilt. 